Story 1 Fine Furs for a Lady When Kid Brady fell in love with Molly McKeever, he decided to leave the criminal gang that he belonged to. His gang worked in the west of New York, between 11th and 12th Avenues, near the river. By day, they stood lazily on street corners in their fine suits, occasionally speaking quietly to each other. But their real business was taking money from the good people of New York. Mostly, they preferred to do this without any noise or any blood. But any New Yorkers who weren't happy to lose their money in this way soon found themselves either in the hospital or the name of a newly dead person in a police notebook. When Brady told the others that he was leaving the gang, they were sorry. He was the finest, strongest, and cleverest of them all. But they didn't try to stop him. For criminals like them, it was neither wrong nor unmanly to do what your girlfriend wanted. Okay, Brady told Molly one night when she was asking him to end his life of crime. I'll get a job, and in a year, I'll marry you. We can get somewhere nice to live. Oh, kid, said Molly. That's great. We can be happy with just a little. But, said Brady, I won't have money for good suits like before. That'll be hard. Don't worry. I'll love you just the same. So Brady started working as a plumber. That was what he studied when he was younger. For eight months, he worked hard and stayed true to Molly. Then, one day, he came home with a strange parcel. Open that, Moll, he said quietly. It's for you. Molly took off the paper, screamed happily, and put something long, dark, and soft around her neck. The best Russian furs said Brady. Thank you, kid, said Molly. I never had any furs before, but aren't Russian furs expensive? Could I ever buy you anything cheap? Hey, Moll, you look great in them. Then he saw Molly looking at him with sad eyes. He knew what that look meant. I paid for them with good money, he said. Sure. With the $75 a month that you get from working as a plumber. Look, I had some money from before, too. I left the gang for you, Moll, remember? Now put on those furs and let's go out for a walk. So they went for a walk. Fine Russian furs were big news for the poor people living on that side of New York. Soon, everyone was talking about them. Detective Ransom was walking down the street not far behind them. Why is everyone so excited? He asked one man standing on a street corner. Kid Brady got his girlfriend the best Russian furs, they say. Has anyone lost any expensive furs lately? But Brady left the gang, didn't he? Now I heard that he's working at his old job. Right, but some say that he paid $900 for those furs. How can a plumber find money like that? Ransom walked faster and soon found Brady and Molly walking slowly along the street. Can I speak to you for a minute? He asked quietly, touching Brady's arm. Brady looked at him angrily. Were you at Mrs. Hethcote's house on West 7th Street yesterday, mending a water pipe? Yes, said Brady. Why? The old lady's thousand-dollar Russian furs left the house at about the same time that you did. 
The way that Mrs. Heathcote described them, they're just like the ones that the young lady's wearing. Ransom, Brady began. I bought those furs today at... And then he stopped. Okay, so let's go to the shop where you bought the furs, with the lady, and find out if what you're saying is true. Let's do that, said Brady hotly. Then he looked suddenly across at Molly's worried face and smiled strangely. It's no good, he said suddenly. You're right, Ransom. They're the Heathcote furs. Molly, you'll have to give them to the police. Molly, her eyes full of tears, held Brady's arm. Oh, kid. How could you do it? I was so pleased with you. And now they'll send you to jail. And where's our happy life together? Come on, Ransom, said Brady wildly. Take the furs. I'm ready. Wait a minute. I think I'll... No, I can't. Molly, go home. Just then, Policeman Cohen came round the corner. Ransom stopped him and explained about the furs. Sure. I heard about the Heathcote furs, said Cohen. And you say that these are the same? Can I see them? I sold furs when I was younger. He looked at the furs carefully. These are Alaskan, not Russian. And they cost about twenty dollars. Suddenly, Brady hit Cohen in the face. Molly screamed, and Ransom quickly put some handcuffs on the kid. They cost about twenty dollars only. Cohen went on. Not a thousand. Brady's face turned red. You're right, he said. I paid twenty-one dollars fifty for them. But I was ready to go to prison for six months for Molly never to know how much they really cost. I hate cheap things. Molly put her arms round his neck. Look, I don't want expensive furs or lots of money. I just want you, kid. She said. Take the handcuffs off him, Inspector, said Cohen. While I was leaving the police station, I heard the latest news about the Heathcote furs. The old lady found them at the back of her wardrobe. Young man, I'll forget about you hitting me. Just this once. Just before the policemen left, Ransom gave Molly back her furs. She smiled at Brady and put them round her neck again, like a real lady. Story 2. Springtime on the Menu It was a March day in Manhattan, and Sarah was crying over her menu. Perhaps you think that she was sad because she was eating carefully and didn't want to see ice cream on the menu. Well. You're wrong. Sarah was sitting at her desk with a typewriter in front of her. She worked at home, typing things for people. Her best job was working for Schollenberg's restaurant. This stood next to the house where she had a room. When she ate there one winter evening, she noticed that the writing on the menu card was really difficult to understand. That night, she typed out the menu, and the next day, she showed it to Mr. Schollenberg. He at once gave her the job of typing out menus for his restaurant every day. For this work, Mr. Schollenberg agreed to pay Sarah in food. After that, a waiter took three meals every day to Sarah's room 
together with the new menu of the day and pencil for Sarah to type. Now it was an afternoon in March, springtime, but the weather was still as cold as winter, and Sarah felt sad. She looked out of her window at the factory opposite, but she didn't really see it. She was remembering her holiday in the country last summer. Sarah stayed two weeks at Sunny Brook Farm. There, she fell in love with old Farmer Franklin's son, Walter. He took her for long walks in the country, and one day they sat together under a tree, and he made a crown of dandelion flowers and put it on her head. Those yellow flowers look really beautiful in your brown hair," said Walter. And Sarah walked back to the farmhouse with the dandelion crown on her head, and her hat in her hand. "I'm going to marry you first thing next spring," said Walter, and his eyes shone. And then. Sarah came back to the big city, and her work as a typist. Suddenly, a knock on her room door made her forget those happy days. It was the waiter from Schollenberg's with the new menu. She put a white card in the typewriter, and began. Her fingers danced across the typewriter keys. The soups were first. The meats came next. After that, it was the vegetables: potatoes, carrots, tomatoes, and then Sarah was crying over the menu. She was waiting for a letter from Walter, and during the past two weeks, no letter came. And now, on the menu that she was typing, she read dandelions, and something about an egg. She remembered Walter making that dandelion crown for her, and saying that he wanted to marry her in the spring. And now, seeing those beautiful flowers as just something to eat on the menu in front of her, she felt terrible. At last, she stopped crying. For a while, she touched the keys of the typewriter sadly, still thinking of her young farmer friend. But soon, she was busy typing card after card. At six o'clock, the waiter from Schollenberg's brought her dinner, and took away the finished menus. After dinner. Sarah took a book from the table, sat down in a comfortable chair, and began to read. Just then, there was a ring at the front door. The landlady opened it. Sarah put down her book, and listened. Hearing a man's voice downstairs, she suddenly jumped up from her chair, opened her room door. And ran out to the top of the stairs. There, running up the stairs towards her, was Walter, and soon she was in his arms. Why didn't you write? She asked. I wanted to surprise you, so I went to your old address, but they told me that you weren't living there. I didn't know where to find you, but I wrote to you with my new address. I never got it. So how did you find me? The young farmer smiled. Well, I went to the restaurant next door for dinner and looked at the menu. When I got to just below tomatoes, I jumped out of my chair and called for Mr. Schulenberg. He told me where you lived. I remember," 
said Sarah softly. Dandelions came just below tomatoes. I knew that it was your typing because of the strange way that your typewriter types the W's higher than the other letters. But there isn't a letter W in dandelion, cried Sarah in surprise. The young man took a menu from his pocket and gave it to her. At the top, there was a round gray mark from one of her tears. Sarah knew that it was the card she was typing when she began crying about the summer. And there, just below tomatoes, in place of dandelions, she read, Dearest Walter, with an egg on top. Story 3 The Last Leaf Sue and Joanna had the top floor of a house in Greenwich Village, where everyone in the New York art world lives. Sue came from Maine, and Joanna from California. They met in May in an Italian restaurant on 8th Street. They liked each other at once. Their tastes were the same, and so they decided to live together. Both were artists. Now it was November. Cold, windy, and wet. And pneumonia was in town. Joanna was ill in bed with it, Sue and the doctor spoke outside her bedroom door. Will she live? asked Sue. It's a one in ten chance, but she must want to live. What does she have to live for? Well, she'd like to paint a picture of Naples one day. Paint? No, that's not good enough. I mean, is she interested in a man, for example? No, doctor, said Sue. There's no man in her life. What bad luck, said the doctor. I'll do all that I can, but I'm not hopeful. When the doctor left, Sue cried for a while. <laughs> Then, she went busily into Joanna's room with her drawing book, singing a happy song. La, 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 la. Joanna's eyes were closed. She's asleep, thought Sue, and stopped singing. She sat down by the window and began drawing a picture of a young farm worker for a magazine. Suddenly, she heard Joanna speaking softly. She went to her. Joanna's eyes were open now, and she was counting aloud, counting down. Twelve, she said, and after a while, Eleven, ten, nine, and then, Eight, seven, six, nearly at the same time. Sue looked out of the window. She saw only the wall of the next house with an old yellow and green ivy plant that climbed up it. The half-dead plant had few leaves on it because of the autumn winds. There are only five now, said Joanna. Five what, dear? What are you counting? The ivy leaves, replied Joanna. When the last one goes, I'll die. I've known that for two days. Didn't the doctor tell you about it? Joanna, don't say that. 
It doesn't matter what happens to that old plant. It has nothing to do with you. Now, eat some soup, and I'll finish my picture. I don't want any soup, said Joanna, looking out of the window. Now there are only four. Joanna, dear, try to sleep. I must ask Mr. Berman to come up. I want to draw a picture of him as a poor old farmer. I won't be long. Mr. Berman, who was over 60 years old, lived downstairs. He was a painter, too, but he never sold anything, and he drank a lot. He had a wonderful face, just right for Sue's magazine picture. Sue told him all about Joanna, feeling that she was going to die when the last ivy leaf fell. She can't really think that this will happen. The poor woman, he cried. She's thinking very strangely these days, said Sue. When they went upstairs, Joanna was asleep. Sue closed her window blind and left the room. In Sue's workroom, she and Berman looked worriedly out of the window at the old ivy plant. Then Berman sat, and Sue drew him in half an hour. The next day, Sue woke up early. She heard a call from Joanna's room. Open the window blind, Joanna said when she arrived. Once the blind was open, they both saw one last leaf on the ivy plant. Oh, said Joanna. With all that wind and rain last night, I'm surprised. But I'm sure it'll fall today. And then I'll die. The day was a windy one. But, all through it, the last leaf stayed. And on the morning of the next day, too, the leaf was still there. Susie, said Joanna then, I've been a bad girl. That last leaf is telling me that it was very wrong of me to want to die. <sighs> Bring me some soup, dear. An hour later, she said, One day, I'll paint Naples. That afternoon, the doctor told Sue, She has a one in two chance. The next day, he said, She's out of danger, but poor Mr. Berman downstairs is dying of pneumonia. There's no hope for him, I'm afraid. That afternoon, Sue went into Joanna's bedroom. Joanna, dear, Mr. Berman died today of pneumonia. And do you know why? One terrible, cold, wet night, he took a ladder and some green and yellow paints, and he climbed up and, oh! Look at that last ivy leaf on the wall. Why didn't it ever move in the wind? Can't you see? It was Mr. Berman's last great picture. He painted it there the night that the last leaf fell. Story 4 The Things We Do for Love As a boy, Joe Larrabee was famous in the town in Middle America where he lived because he could paint beautifully. At 20, he went to study in New York. Delia Carruthers was from the South 
and played music wonderfully as a girl. When she was 18, her family paid for her to study in New York. Joe and Delia met one day in the big city, fell in love, and soon after got married. They went to live in a little flat far from the center. Joe studied painting with Mr. Magister, and Delia studied music with Mr. Rosenstock. They were very happy while their money lasted. But soon, they couldn't pay for more classes with Magister and Rosenstock, who were expensive. So Delia said she would give music lessons to get some money. After two days, she came home excitedly. I found a student, she said. Her name's Clementina. She's General A.B. Pinckney's daughter. They live in a wonderful big house on 71st Street. Clementina's only 18, wears white, and is a lovely girl. I'm going to give her three lessons a week for five dollars each. Just think, when I get more students, I can go back to Rosenstock. I can't let you do all the work, said Joe. I must get a job too, even if it's only selling newspapers in the street. Oh, no, Joe, replied Delia. You mustn't stop your classes with Magister. All right, said Joe. I really don't like you giving lessons. It isn't art, but you're a dear to do it. When you love your art, nothing is too hard, said Delia softly. Well, Tinkle said that I could put some of my pictures in his window. Perhaps I'll sell one to a rich old man one of these days. I'm sure that you will, said Delia. That Saturday, she put $15 on the small table in the middle of their small sitting room. Clementina's terrible, she said. She never studies, never listens to me, and always wears white, which gets boring after a while. But the general's a nice, friendly man. Just then, Joe put $18 on the table. I sold a picture today to a fat man from Arizona, he said. He saw it in Tinkle's window. He doesn't really understand art, but he wants another picture of a train station before he goes home. Oh, I'm so happy that you didn't stop painting, said Delia. And now we have $33. What a lot of money. We can have a really good dinner tonight. The next Saturday evening, Joe got home first. He put $18 on the table and washed what looked like black paint from his hands. Then Delia came home. Her hand had some white cloth around it, and her face was dark with worry. What happened? asked Joe. Oh, Clementina wanted a hot cheese sandwich in the middle of her lesson. Strange girl. Unluckily, lots of hot cheese fell onto my hand and hurt it terribly. The general was very worried and sent someone from downstairs to buy some things to put on it. But now it doesn't hurt so much. Then she saw Joe's money on the table. Did you sell another picture? Yes, to the man from Arizona. But what time did you hurt your hand? It was five o'clock when the iron, I mean, when the cheese burnt me. Sit down, Delia, said Joe kindly. 
And tell me where your money really comes from. Delia began crying. I couldn't find any music students, she said. So, I took a job in the big laundry on 24th Street. I told you stories about the General and Clementina to stop you feeling bad about my work. Then today, another girl at the laundry put a hot iron on my hand, and I thought of that hot cheese story on the way home. Please don't be angry. But how did you find out that my stories weren't true? Well, said Joe, at five o'clock I had to send up some oil and cloth for a woman in the laundry upstairs after she burnt her hand on an iron. I'm working downstairs in the engine room. I started there two weeks ago. So you didn't really sell? My buyer from Arizona and your General Pinckney are both works of art, but not really music or painting. They both laughed. <laughs> <laughs> when you love your art, nothing began Joe. But Delia put her hand over his mouth to stop him. No, she said. It's just when you love. Story 5, Ike Schoenstein's Love Potion The Blue Light Drug Store was on the east side of New York, near First Avenue. All the medicines there were made by hand. Ike Schoenstein worked there at night. A thin, clever man with a long nose and glasses, he was friendly to all who came for help when they were ill. Ike lived in a room in a house not far from the drug store. His landlady was Mrs. Riddle, and she had a daughter, Rosie. Ike was deeply in love with Rosie, but he never told her about it. That was strange, because he was very good at talking to people in the drugstore. There was another man living at Mrs. Riddle's house who was in love with Rosie, too. His name was Chunk McGowan. Ike had no hope of winning Rosie's love, but McGowan was very hopeful. He was also Ike's friend. He often came to the drugstore, after a night fighting in the street, for something to put on a black eye or a cut. One afternoon, he came hurriedly into the drugstore and went straight to speak to his friend, Ike. I need some special medicine, he said. Take off your coat, said Ike, and tell me where it hurts. Were you in a fight again? One of these days you'll get a knife in your back. <laughs> it wasn't a fight, said McGowan, laughing. But you're right. It's under my coat that it hurts. In my heart. Ike, Rosie and me are going to run away tonight to Harlem to get married. Ike was mixing some medicine while he listened, and he tried not to drop it all on the floor. McGowan's smiling face now looked worried. The thing is, we first thought of the plan two weeks ago. Sometimes Rosie says yes to it, and sometimes no. For the past two days, she said yes, and we're hoping to leave in five hours' time. 
I don't want her to change her plans at the last minute. And where does medicine come into it? Asked Ike. Well, you see, old Mr. Riddle doesn't like me. For a week now, he's stopped Rosie coming out with me. I'm worried that she won't want to leave tonight because of him. Isn't there a medicine that you can give to a woman to make her like you better? I had a friend, Tim Lacey, who gave a potion like that to his girlfriend, and they got married two weeks later. McGowan didn't notice Ike's knowing smile at these words of his, and he went on. If I can just give a love potion to Rosie at dinner tonight, I'm sure that she'll come with me. And when are you running away? Nine o'clock. Dinner's at seven. At eight, Rosie goes to bed with a bad head. At nine, I come round the back of the house and help her down the fire escape from her window. Then, we're going straight to church to get married. We have to be careful about selling love potions, said Ike. But because you're my friend, I'll make it for you and you'll see how it changes the way Rosie thinks of you. Then he carefully made a sleeping potion. It was sure to make anyone who took it sleep for a number of hours without waking up. He gave the potion to his friend, telling him to put it into a drink if possible. McGowan thanked him and left. After that, Ike sent a note to Mr. Riddle, telling him about McGowan's plans. Riddle came to the drugstore that afternoon. He was a strong, red-faced, angry man. Thanks for telling me, Ike, he said. That lazy, good-for-nothing Irishman. My room is just over Rosie's room. After dinner, I'll wait up there with my gun. If McGowan comes this evening, he'll go straight to the hospital and not to church tonight. With Rosie asleep in her room and old Riddle upstairs with his gun, McGowan's chances aren't looking good, thought Ike happily after Riddle left. Next morning at 8 o'clock, Ike finished work and started walking to Mrs. Riddle's house to learn the latest news. There, in the street, he met Chunk McGowan. McGowan shook Ike's hand and thanked him warmly. It worked, he said, smiling. Rosie and me are now man and wife. You must come for dinner over at our place in Harlem sometime soon. But the potion, asked Ike. Oh, that, laughed McGowan. In the end, I felt bad about questioning Rosie's love. But old Riddle was very unfriendly to me at dinner. It wasn't right for him to be so hard on the man who wanted to marry his daughter, I felt. So I put the potion in his coffee. Story 6 The Count and the Wedding Guest At dinner one night, in the boarding house where Andy Donovan lived, near 2nd Avenue, his landlady introduced him to a new paying guest, Miss Conway. Nice to meet you, Mr. Donovan, said Miss Conway quietly, and then she went back to her meal. She was an uninteresting young woman in a boring brown dress. Andy gave her a smile and forgot her at once. 
Two weeks later, Andy was smoking a cigar outside the front door when he heard someone coming out. He turned to see who it was and was pleasantly surprised. There was Miss Conway, all in black from her head to her feet, with her bright gold hair, her gray eyes, and her sad face, she looked lovely. Morning clothes can make any woman look beautiful and are sure to make any man look twice. Andy immediately decided not to forget Miss Conway. He dropped his half-finished cigar on the ground and said, It's a fine evening, Miss Conway. For those with a heart to enjoy it, Mr. Donovan, she replied sadly, looking down. I hope there hasn't been a death in the family, he said. Not really in the family, she replied. But I won't worry you with my troubles. Worry me? But I'd really like to hear all about them, Miss Conway. I mean, please feel free to speak to a true friend in your time of need. Miss Conway smiled sadly at this. I feel so lonely in New York, she said. I have no friends here, but you have been kind to me, Mr. Donovan. Thank you for that. It was true. Andy sometimes passed the salt to her at the dinner table. You're right, he said. It's hard when you're alone. But why don't you take a walk in the park? That'll make you feel better, I'm sure. I'll go along with you if you want. Thank you, Mr. Donovan. I'd like that. If you're happy to take a walk with someone like me, who has a sad and heavy heart. He was my fiancé, said Miss Conway after an hour in the park. We wanted to get married. He was a real Italian count with a big old house in Italy. Count Fernando Mazzini was his name, and he was a great dresser. Father didn't agree to it, of course. When we ran away together, he came after us and found us. In the end, when he learned how rich Fernando was, Father agreed to a spring wedding. Fernando wanted to give me a wedding present of $7,000 for the dress, the flowers, the dinner, and all. But Father was proud and said no. So when the Count went back to Italy to get his big old house ready for us, I got myself a job in a candy store to help pay for the wedding. Then three days ago, I got a letter from Italy saying that Fernando was dead. It was a terrible gondola accident that killed him, they said. So that explains my mourning, Mr. Donovan. I'll never forget Fernando, you see. And after losing him, I'm afraid I just can't look at any other man. I'm really sorry for you, said Andy. And I'm your true friend. I want you to know that. I have his picture here in my locket, said Miss Conway tearfully. And because you're a true friend, Mr. Donovan, I'll show it to you. For some time, Andy studied the photograph in the locket that Miss Conway opened for him. The man's face was young, bright, and clever. It was the face of a strong man that other people are always ready to follow. I have a larger photograph in my room, said Miss Conway. I'll show you later. They're the only things that I have of Fernando now, but he'll always be in my heart.
Andy decided there and then to try to win Miss Conway's heart from the Count. He took her to have an ice cream, but her gray eyes still looked sad. That evening, she brought down the larger photograph and showed it to Andy. He looked at it silently. He gave this to me the night that he left for Italy, said Miss Conway. A fine-looking man, said Andy. Now, would you like to come out with me again next Sunday afternoon? A month later, they told the landlady and the other guests at the boarding house of their plans to get married. Miss Conway stayed in mourning. A week after that, they were sitting in the park near the boarding house. Andy's usually smiling face was dark with worry, and he was strangely silent. What's the matter, Andy? asked Miss Conway. Well, you've heard of Big Mike Sullivan, haven't you? said Andy after a while. No, I haven't. Who is he? He's a great New York politician and a friend of mine. I met him today, and he wants to come to our wedding. I'd really like him to come. Okay, so he can be our guest. Right, but before we can have our wedding, I need to know something. Do you still prefer Count Mazzini over me? Suddenly, Miss Conway started crying. <sighs> Oh, Andy, there never was a count. All the other girls had boyfriends, but I didn't. And you know how good I look in black. So I bought a big photograph of a man that I didn't know at a photograph store and got a small one, too, for my locket. Then I thought up the story of the Count's death and put on my black clothes. I'm just a big fake. And now you won't marry me because of it, I'm sure. And you're the only man that I've ever loved. Smiling, Andy took her in his arms. Do you still want to marry me? After what I've done? She asked in surprise. Of course, he replied. You were very good to explain it all to me. Now we can forget the count. There's nothing to stop us becoming man and wife. Andy, Miss Conway went on. Did you really think that my stories about the count were true? Not really, he replied, taking out a cigar. Mostly because that photograph in your locket is of my friend, Mike Sullivan. Story 7. Thinking Yourself Rich My real name's Jeff Peters. But when I visited Fisher Hill, Arkansas, I went there as Dr. Wahoo, the famous Indian medicine man. I had only five dollars in my pocket, so I got 50 medicine bottles from the drugstore and went straight to my hotel room. The other things that I needed were in my bag. At the hotel, I put water, purple coloring, and a little chinchona, real medicine that comes from a Peruvian tree, into every bottle. Then I put labels on them saying, Dr. Wahoo's Indian Potion, sure to bring the dead to life. I was ready for business. I started that night on a street in the center of town. 
After selling 25 bottles at 20 cents each, I felt a hand on my arm. It was a policeman. Do you have a license to sell medicine here? He asked. No, I don't, I replied. Well, you'll have to stop then. I stopped, went back to my hotel at once, and spoke to the landlord. You'll never get a license, he said. Dr. Hoskins is the only doctor here, and his wife's the mayor's sister. A fake doctor has no chance. I'm not a doctor. I'm a traveling salesman. And I'll get a license tomorrow. I went to the mayor's office early the next day, but he wasn't there. So I went back to my hotel, sat in a chair, had a smoke, and waited. Soon, a young man in a blue suit sat down next to me and asked me the time. It's 10 o'clock, I said. And you're Andy Tucker. I remember you. Andy was a good street salesman, and I needed a partner. So we agreed to go outside. He was just off the train and had plans to ask people in Fisher Hill for money to build a new bathhouse at Eureka Springs. I told him how things were in Fisher Hill, and we sat and talked. Next morning at 11 o'clock, an old black man came looking for me at the hotel where I sat alone. You must come, sir, he said. The mayor's terribly ill. He needs your help. Get Dr. Hoskins, I replied. He can't come, sir. He's in the country. But the mayor's nearly dying. He needs help right now. Okay, I said. I can't leave a man in need. I'll come. When I arrived, I found the mayor in bed looking bad. A young man stood near him holding a cup of water. Doctor, can you help me? It's terrible, said the mayor. Well, I'm not here as a doctor, I said, but as a friend. Thank you, Dr. Wahoo, he replied. This young man is my nephew, Mr. Biddle. He's tried to help, but it's no good. Ooh, it hurts. I nodded at Biddle and sat on the bed. I looked at the mayor's eyes, tongue, and ears and listened to his heart and chest. What's the matter with me? He asked. Mr. Mayor, I said, I'm sorry to say that you have a dangerous pneumonia of the circular dandelion in the upper right vegetable of your heart. Can you give me something for it? Medicine won't touch it, I'm afraid, I said. Your only hope is hypnosis. Hypno what? said the mayor. It means me helping you to think yourself well again. I explained helpfully. Can you do that? asked the mayor. Well, I'm not a doctor, you understand, but to save your life, I'm more than ready to do some hypnosis on you, if you forget the license question. Of course, he said. And please, can you start now? It's hurting a lot. Hypnosis costs $250 for two visits, I said. That's not much to pay for my life, said the mayor. So I began. Looking him in the eye, I said, Look into my eyes. You're sleepy. Your upper right vegetable isn't hurting now. The circular dandelion's going. You have no upper right vegetable, no heart, no body. Your eyes are closing. I left him sleeping and went back to the hotel. The next day, I went back to his house early. How is he? I asked Mr. Biddle at the bedroom door. A lot better, said the young man. I did some more hypnosis on the mayor 
and he said that nothing hurt him after that. Stay in bed, rest for two days, and you'll be fine. You were very lucky that I was in town yesterday, I said. And now for my money. Here it is, said the mayor, taking the bills from the table by his bed and giving them to me. And put your name on this, he went on, giving me a paper that said, For two visits by Dr. Wahoo to the mayor of Fisher Hill, $250. I wrote Dr. Wahoo at the bottom of the paper and gave it back to him. Now do your work, officer, said the mayor with a big smile on his face. Suddenly, he didn't look ill at all. Mr. Biddle put his hand on my arm. I arrest you, Dr. Wahoo, or Jeff Peters, to give you your usual name, for selling fake medicine without a license, he said. Who are you? I cried. He's a detective, said the mayor, working for the Arkansas Medical Society. He's followed you all over Arkansas for weeks. He came to me yesterday and told me all about you, and we made a plan to catch you. You won't sell your fake medicine around here anymore. A detective, I said. That's right. And now we're going to see the sheriff, said the young man. Oh, no, we're not, I cried, taking his neck in my hands and nearly pushing him through the window. Then he pulled out a gun and put it to my head. I stood still. After that, he put handcuffs on me and took the money out of my pocket. I'll need to take this to the sheriff, sir. I'll be sure to tell him that these were your bills with my marks on them. You'll get it all back once the criminal is in jail. That's fine by me, Mr. Biddle, said the mayor. Then he turned to me, laughing. Well, Dr. Wahoo, show us your famous hypnosis now. Make those handcuffs go away by thinking yourself free again. Come on, officer, I said. I'll go quietly. At the door, I shook my handcuffs at the mayor, saying, The time will come when you understand that hypnosis works and that it worked very well for me here today, too. And in a way, that was true. When we arrived out on the street, I said to Mr. Biddle, Somebody could see us. Take the handcuffs off now, Andy. And he did. Biddle was really my old friend Andy Tucker, you see, and it was all his idea. And that's how we started in business together. Story 8 Lost and Found Near Abingdon Square, there was a house with a small store selling stationery on the ground floor. Both the house and the store belonged to old Mrs. Mayo. One night twenty years ago, there was a wedding in the rooms over the store. Helen, Mrs. Mayo's daughter, married Frank Barry. Frank's best friend, John Delaney, was the best man. Helen was only 18 at the time, and before the wedding, both Frank and John were in love with her. But when Frank won her heart, John shook his friend's hand and said, Congratulations. After the wedding, Helen ran upstairs to put on her hat. She and Frank were leaving for a week's honeymoon in Virginia 
that same night. The rest of the wedding party were still downstairs. Suddenly, she heard someone running up the fire escape, and John Delaney jumped into the room. Come away with me tonight, he cried. I love you. What do you mean speaking to me like that? I'm a married woman, said Helen coldly. I can't help it. I love you. I'll always love you. Go back down the fire escape this minute. If you won't have me, I'll travel the world. I'll go to Africa and try to forget you. Get out, said Helen, before someone comes in. John knelt on the floor in front of her, and she gave him her hand to kiss. Just then, Frank walked in, worrying why Helen was taking so long to put on her hat. John kissed Helen's hand and ran out of the room and down the fire escape to Africa. What was all that about? shouted Frank. Helen went to him and tried to explain, but it was no good. Frank threw her to the floor, saying, I never want to see you again. Then he ran downstairs, past the surprised wedding guests, and out into the night. When Mrs. Mayo died, her daughter, Helen Berry, inherited the store and the house. Twenty years after her wedding, Mrs. Berry was still beautiful. Because business in the store wasn't good, Mrs. Berry decided to take paying guests upstairs. Two large rooms on the third floor were made ready for them, one at the front of the house and one at the back. One day, a musician arrived and took the front room. His name was Ramonti. He played the violin and was looking for a quiet place to live. He had a fine head of gray hair, and his face, with its short, foreign-looking beard, still looked young. He was friendly, and Mrs. Berry enjoyed having him in the house. She had a comfortable room for herself, half office and half sitting room, on the first floor. Here, she wrote her business letters at her desk during the day, or sat and read in the evening by a warm fire. Ramonti often visited her there, telling her all about his time as a poor young music student in Paris many years before, when he studied with a world-famous violinist. Mrs. Berry's second paying guest was a good-looking man in his early forties. He had a brown beard and strangely sad eyes. He also liked spending time with Mrs. Berry and telling her about his travels. There was a mystery about this man that Mrs. Berry found most interesting. His voice made her remember her first love all those years ago. Soon, she felt sure that he belonged, in some way, to that past story. In the end, she decided, in the way that women have, that this man was her husband of long ago. She saw the love in his eyes, but she said nothing to him about it. After all, a husband who leaves home on his wedding night for twenty years can't hope to find his wife waiting for him with open arms when he comes back. One evening, Ramonti came to speak to Helen. I love you and want to marry you, he told her. But before you say anything, I must tell you that my manager gave me the name Ramonti. 
I don't really know who I am or where I come from. The first thing that I remember in my life is waking up as a young man in a hospital. I know nothing of what happened before then. They told me that I hit my head badly on the ground in the street one night and that an ambulance brought me to the hospital. No one knew who I was. After I left the hospital, I started playing the violin, and now I'm a famous musician. But, Mrs. Barry, the first time that I saw you, I knew that you were the only woman in the world for me. Helen felt young again, and very happy, while she looked into Ramonti's eyes. Her heart was full of love for the violinist, which came as a great surprise to her. Mr. Ramonti, she said quickly, I'm sorry, but I must ask you to stop. You see, I'm a married woman. Then she told him the sad story of her life. After that, Ramonti took her hand, kissed it softly, and went up to his room slowly. Helen looked sadly down at her hand. Two kisses on it, and only two lovers' goodbyes for her to remember. It was really just too bad for words. Later that evening, her other paying guest came to speak to her. He also said that he loved her. Helen, don't you remember me? He cried. I thought that I saw it in your eyes. Can you forget the past and remember the love that has lasted for 20 years? I've been so bad to you. I was afraid to come back, but my love was stronger. Can you forgive me? Helen didn't know what to do. Half her heart was full of her old love for her husband, but a newer, stronger love filled the other half, and both loves fought against each other. Just then, she heard soft, sad, sweet violin music coming from upstairs. The music and the musician called her, but doing the right thing stopped her from going. Forgive me, said the man at her side. Twenty years is a long time to stay away from the woman that you say you love. But I wasn't sure, he cried. Look, I'll tell you everything. That night, when he left, I went after him. I didn't know what I was doing. On a dark street, I knocked him down and he didn't get up again. There was blood on his head from where it hit the hard ground. I didn't mean to kill him. I hid not far away and saw an ambulance come for him. I know that you married him, Helen, but... Who are you? cried the woman in surprise. Don't you remember me, Helen? I'm the one that always loved you the best. I'm John Delaney. Can you forgive? But she was far away, hurrying upstairs towards the music, towards the man who didn't remember, but who knew that she was the one for him in each of his two lives. And running lightly up those long stairs, she called him by his old name. Frank, Frank. 